Sigmund Freud. What do you make of the ideas that he had? So you mentioned taking the unconscious, the subconscious seriously. That's like step one, like that there could be worlds we do not have direct access for and we probe at them through conversation or um, is that too simplistic to call psychoanalysis conversation? <laughs> that's not too simplistic, but that's right. And I think that was valuable. Where where Freud ended up breaking from some of his contemporaries, he was very focused on this unconscious as being so tightly linked to libido, and and really, he from his perspective, you couldn't really separate the operation of the unconscious mind from these aspects, the libidinous aspects, and and that was What's one reason. Libidinous aspects, you know, sex, sexual, sexually related, uh, you know, drives. Carl Jung, who was his, you know, uh, you know, contemporary. That's one factor that led to them separating. Was you know, Carl Jung felt there was a lot more to the unconscious than than this libidinous uh, aspect of it, and he saw it as a much more complete uh, uh, alternate representation of the the conscious self, one that maybe reflected a whole range of different motivations and and desires. Um, and to, to properly treat it, one had to consider all of them rather than the ones that, yeah, that so Freud was focused Carl on. Jung, shout, your mother, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for the high level of, uh, of images that Sergei is pulling up. For people who are just listening, he pulled up a, as a quote from uh, Sigmund Freud, it's a meme, your mom quote, uh, Freud. Uh, so the, the shadow, the Carl Jung shadow encompasses everything, not just the desire to have sex with your mother or sex, period. That's that was, right, that's right. If you look at those two folks en masse, I mean, there's a kind of, it's almost like a technique for philosophical exploration of human mind, human motivations. So it's not even like necessarily, it's also doubles as a methodology for helping people, but it's almost like a, um, it's a kind of, philosophical method. Right. This is the fascinating thing about about psychoanalysis and and it even though it's it's I would say mostly not considered a, a treatment today, it persists for a couple of reasons. One is it it's it's thought that it gives people some insight. But second, there's been a huge influence on on literature, on philosophy, on art and the the opening up of discussion about what was Below our conscious mind was uh, so so fertile in, in the implications that it it sort of reverberated and still does throughout all these different realms of, of human endeavor from art, art, different artistic uh, you know experiences that people have can be colored by this this uh, concept of the unconscious. Now the other thing that was interesting is 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 this distinction. You know what? What are the parts of the unconscious? And and so there were these id and ego and superego uh, subdivisions that you know that that Freud, for example, would 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 talk about them. And and the the id was the primary, the primal drives that an infant would have, uh, or or that a very young child just warmth and feeding, and then and later the you know the the sexual or libidinous aspects. And for Freud, the later happened very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the controversial thing about him, I think. I guess he thought like even children had sexual desires that they're like dealing with, contending with. So it's the full thing. Hungry, wanting to eat, wanting to poop, wanting to have sex. Yeah, and he was extremely focused on that on, on that aspect. But then there was then there was this, the superego, which brought on these later sort of moralistic uh, uh, sort of codes of, of conduct, and and that of course was very often in, in, in tension. But all this could play out subconsciously, and then the ego, this third aspect, was mediating, and, and Freud's conception mediated this tension between the different uh, parts. Now, I think that's interesting. Uh, I will say that, in some ways, it's maybe unnecessary from the perspective of modern neuroscience to. Divide things up that way from the you know the the moralistic uh, drives and the the primal uh, gratification drives, 
in some ways they're all drives and maybe they're even all primal drives you know the the moralistic drives they're they're taught and they're taught in ways that ultimately relate back to survival and uh you could even say selfish aspects of of health and life for the self and family and so this is uh i don't i think it's maybe an artificial distinction the concept of the unconscious is very valuable and very interesting um but these categorizations uh of id and and uh, superego may not map onto neurobiology in any particular way is there's a town hall of of competing drives and desires and they're they, they interrelate to each other they involve different aspects of the of the brain and the and the history of the person and actions and choices come out of the result of that overall you know shouting in the town hall so in some sense Carl Jung was a step into the direction of liberating yourself from such harsh categorizations yes. do you think i mean you have uh, daniel kahneman with system 1 and system 2 there's just these very compelling categorizations of the human mind that seem to be st sticky in our uh in the super ego no uh in the you know in the, the how we talk about these ideas and so on yeah As, do you think those are helpful or did they get in the way is it some kind of balance in terms of deeper understanding of how the mind actually works you know it's from the from modern neuroscience uh <laughs> whenever we seem to get closer to addressing a question like this at the level of cells it seems to get farther away and i'll give you an example of, of what i mean by that so one thing i'm doing in my laboratory and many people are doing is we are listening in on the activity of cells neurons in the brain of mice or rats or fish or monkeys individual cells individual cells exactly of which there are you know in our brain many billions and when we do and we try to predict what action will be taken by an animal to address this question where does the choice arise where does the impetus to make a particular selection of one action versus another action where does that start in the brain if you're recording listening in on the activity of cells all across the brain where is the earliest spot you can pick up a choice being made <laughs> well that's so awesome <laughs> yeah at one level you might think how it, excited would would Jung have been to see this or, or Freud or the early you know psychoanalysts to see where this starts but it's not so simple because an emerging theme in very recent neuroscience literally over the last few years is that things sort of all start together all across the brain and so you can be recording from the cortex this rim of cells at the surface of the brain or you can be recording deeper in a structure called the striatum which is a little older it's more tightly linked to, to to action. And then structures called the thalamus, other parts of the brain. And if you record from these, these all sort of represent the action and the choice more or less all at about the same time, very close. And so it's it, you can't point to a particular spot uh, and say, here's where the choice or the action originates. It's a, it's a it, group. So the, finding the free will neuron <laughs> it's, it's relevant to that question. Nobody is is close to being able to point to such a thing. Well, close is a relative term, and nobody. Uh, what I what I tweet today? Uh, all generalizations are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, including this one, 